Hi, Paul. Bob, how are you doing? I cannot complain. How are you? I'm well as well. Thank you. Great to be talking with you. Same here. Let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show, available on both streaming video and via audio podcast. You are Paul Shapiro. You are in California, and you've written a book. I've been listening to the audio version, so I can't hold the book itself, or I won't hold the book itself up to the camera, but I'll I'll hold uh, the <laughs> audible.com version. It looks beautiful. What a, what actually, <laughs> actually, it's kind of hard to make it. Anyway, it looks, there you go, kind of. Yeah, I there. see okay. it now. Yeah, very so good. So clean meat. Uh, how growing meat without animals will revolutionize dinner in the world. And I can see from your phone that you're on chapter nine. So you've made it quite deep into the book. I'm on That is actually the final chapter. You know, I, know, I, I don't yeah. want to distract us with uh, extraneous material, but when is audible.com, since they're not a sponsor, I can just, I can say <laughs> this. <laughs> uh, <laughs> concern for whether it makes them hate me. When is audible.com going to make it so that the chapter numbers on the audible.com thing correspond to the numbers mm -hmm. on the book. That would be super cool. That would be super cool. In fact, uh, my, my fiance, Tony has mentioned this same thing to me before because she pretty much only listens to books on audio. Um, and yeah. so she's, uh, she's commented on that to me, <laughs> to me before. So, uh, that's now two people in my life. So there must be more who feel the same. What, what it shows us is that when a company has in effect a monopoly, it will not good, do a good job of serving the actual needs of the customers. Speaking of companies, uh, this is a masterful, <laughs> good, masterful good, transition we've got coming up. Great segue. You are uh, the CEO and co-founder of the Better Meat Company. We can we can get into what that is uh, later. You're also co-host of the Business for Good podcast. I assume that's Business for Good podcast, not Business for Good podcast. Although <laughs> there could be Business that, for that, a Good that, that, podcast. That may be a different podcast, but no, it is a podcast where we uh, highlight companies that are doing good in the world. So where they are using their business to actually solve some problem in the world. Okay. Now the problem you are, that, that, that whose solution this book is about is a problem with more than one dimension. Okay. So the problem of eating meat, uh, the old fashioned way, which is to say dead animals, um, is first of all, there are moral concerns that everyone is probably at least vaguely familiar with they they uh i mean one good way if they're if they haven't thought about it much uh to drive the point home is you and i were talking before we got started we're both dog lovers i'm like an yeah. intense dog lover and it's funny it's funny how you know if you say to somebody who owns a dog like mind if i kill your dog and eat it you know <laughs> like, it's like the problem isn't just that it belongs to them it's like morally repugnant to them that you would do that yes and yet i mean i guess i don't need to finish you get the picture I do. And, and I think that uh, if you were to live in a different culture, of course, if you lived like, let's say, in, in India, and you mentioned something similar about cows, many people there would be similarly repulsed. Or if you lived, let's say, in certain parts of China, where eating dogs is customary, they may have no aversion to it whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And so I am a dog lover, but I, I'm really also an animal lover. Uh, I'm, I'm the type of guy who, you know, I feel a kindred spirit with animals. In fact, I, I was actually, I was pretty moved. Uh, there's a passage in, in your latest book on Buddhism where you talked about how you saw this lizard and you felt this kinship where neither one of you had asked to be born. You were both here trying to make the best of this world. And I often feel that same way when I see, mm. uh, when I see other animals, not just dogs, but, but lots of other animals is a common feeling for me. And uh, in the same way that, you know, many people may think of their tribe today as being Homo sapiens in the past was, of course, far narrower. Uh, I, I certainly think of my tribe as much wider than just our species. Now, are you also empathic toward human beings? <laughs> yes, very much. I, I mean, so. like inordinately <laughs> in the same way. You know, uh, I, I, you know I, I, I feel for human beings for sure. At the same time, I've always been like an underdog type of person, or maybe in that other case, the under lizard, or the under chicken, or the under pig. Mm. And be, because humans are the dominant species on the planet today. Uh, I, I certainly, of course, wish for benevolence toward all. Uh, I harbor benevolence toward all of us. But um, I think that because uh, non-human animals face such a tough time, uh, given the hegemony that Homo sapiens have over the rest of the planet, uh, I, I do have a special concern for them in the same way that maybe if you think about vulnerable populations or people might have a special for concern for children or for the elderly, uh, because animals are so vulnerable, they can't speak, they don't have any voice, they can 
almost never can they defend themselves against us. Um, I, I do have a special concern for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is an asymmetry of power in the <coughs> in the farmer pig relationship. Um, <laughs> yes, and, and, yeah. uh, I guess mildly. it's even more glaring when when it's a factory farm. You really you really see the implications. Yes, you do. So. Uh, fact, um, then aside from the uh, kind of moral questions about uh, causing suffering to sentient beings, there is, well, I guess one of the big ones is climate change, right? It, right. Why don't you talk about the connection there? Sure. Well, you know, the United Nations says that if we don't get our act together by 2030 with really reducing our, our climate impact, that we really face uh, civilization threateningly troubling consequences. And uh, one of the greatest impactors on that is uh, raising animals for food. It's uh, responsible for about 15% of global greenhouse gas emissions, which is more than all of the planes, trains, cars, boats, and other for, uh, forms of transportation combined. So it's a really huge portion of the greenhouse gas emissions that we are emitting. And it's not just the greenhouse gas emissions. It's a huge user of land, of water, of oil, and so on. It's also a leading contributor to antibiotic resistance, to animal welfare concerns, to public health problems, and more. So when you look, <coughs> excuse me, when you look at all the problems that conventionally raising animals for food brings, it, you realize like this is not doing anybody any favors. It's not doing us favors, the animals favors, the planet favors, that we need to find alternatives. And there are lots of different alternatives out there, but what my book Clean Meat is about is about one such promising alternative, which involves not necessarily people stop eating animals, but to stop eating whole animals. That is mm -hmm. to say that we can grow real meat from animal cells as opposed to raising entire animals. And it's not science fiction. This is now science fact. In fact, mm -hmm. there are uh, about 30 companies around the planet now that are actually growing this type of so-called clean meat. And many of them have backing from the meat industry itself uh, with the financial investments from mm -hmm. Cargill and Tyson, not to mention people like Bill Gates and Richard Branson and other billionaires. So it's a real industry. They're not commercialized anywhere yet, but I really do think that it's one of the ways that we ought to be exploring to help combat climate change uh, because yeah. we're not going to see a mass shift in human nature uh, as you've written about people really like eating meat we have for hundreds of thousands of years mm -hmm. but uh, maybe there's a solution that won't require us to completely stop eating meat and instead though could free animals from the burdens that we've been placing on them and allow us to basically eat meat but not eat whole animals mm -hmm. right and um, so before we start talking about this, this uh, very young industry and, 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 and ask you what this stuff um, tastes like, because you were one of the actually the first people to taste this kind of uh, meat. You, 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 you um, ate a, like a little meat chip that I guess was kind of like a potato chip that, that had cost like about $100 to produce. And so that's why it's not yet economically viable. But um, before we ask you that, the, the one other thing people – talk about is the sheer um, inefficiency of producing, um, you know, meat the way we produce it. What, what is roughly the ratio of kind of waste? Uh, in other words, um, if you look like, like if everyone just ate grain and stuff instead, right. um, how much more efficient would it be? Vastly more efficient because, it, you know, if you look at the poorer parts of the world, historically speaking, they've largely subsisted on primarily, not entirely, but primarily plant-based diets. And that's because it's just a lot more efficient. It's a lot cheaper to eat plants directly than to funnel plants through animals who are very inefficient converters and then to slaughter and eat those animals ourselves. Now, the exact ratios vary by species. They also vary by the ways in which the animals are raised. But, you know, generally speaking for beef, you might be looking at something like 15 to 20 five calories in for one calorie out. And that's a huge amount of loss. And that's why meat eating has largely been reserved for the wealthier nations. In fact, a lot of immigrants uh, decades ago wanted to come to the U.S. because there were this, this uh, idea that they could eat meat every single day. Of course, to us today, eating meat every day is a, a normal part of our fare. But for humans in the past, that's completely foreign to their experience because it's such a inefficient, expensive way to produce food. So when we eat plants directly, let's say eating rice and beans or eating like pasta primavera or something like that, you end up uh, using far fewer resources than you do to, let's say, make a hamburger or a pork chop or a chicken nugget. Now, you know, one of the problems, of course, is that 
meat consumption, despite being a culprit in so many of the most pressing problems that we face, as we were just talking about, it's going up. Meat consumption in the U.S. is going up. It's going up, especially in places like China and India, where the greatest population growth is occurring. And so if we now have nearly 8 billion of us walking around, and by 2050, we're going to have like probably about 10 billion of us walking around, uh, barring any catastrophes, how are we going to feed ourselves? The earth isn't getting any bigger, but humanity's footprint on the earth is getting bigger. And if we want to basically save ourselves from ourselves, we have to get a lot more efficient about how we produce meat. And you're not going to be able to do that by raising entire animals for food. It just cannot be made that much more efficient that it makes sense. So we have a few options. We could eat less or no meat, which, of course, would be a great thing to do for public health and lots of other reasons. Uh, we can, of course, switch to plant-based meats, which are getting better and better. Companies like Beyond Meat and Impossible Foods and others that are um, taking plants and making them taste like meat. Or there's this third option, which is continuing to eat meat, but just growing it from cells rather than whole animals. Mm -hmm. And that subdivides into two, two, two forms of kind of, uh, right, right. We'll get, we'll get into yeah. that. I mean, there, there, there's more diversity in this industry than I had, than I had imagined. I mean, for example, I hadn't thought of the, I have heard a lot about how good the new strictly plant-based fake meats are, if you'll pardon that expression. Uh, <laughs> although you, I, I guess the people in that industry would rather call them plant-based meats. And, and there's a whole controversy around that with the uh, with the old fashioned meat industry lobbying to keep the new the the, the right the, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the plant based <clears throat> meat companies from calling it meat. But believe it, whatever we call it, I'd heard it's getting very good, and I've had I've tasted some of it. I hadn't thought of uh, that being the big rival to what you're describing in this in this book, which is the the kind of cellular agriculture approach, which right. consists basically of you take actual cells of meat right and then what what is it technically is it a is it is it a clonal process or what no not necessarily you don't have to clone them uh, you just have to feed them and the cells do what they would do in the body so uh, if we were to take let's say a tiny little sesame seed sized biopsy out of a cow or a pig and you take these muscle cells, they're called myocytoid cells, and their sole career path in life is to become more muscle. So if you do a hard workout or you get bruised, you get injured for some reason, those cells are already in your muscle, they go to work, and they create new muscle, the very kind of muscle that we eat when we eat meat. Well, if you take those and you put them in a cultivator, you keep them at the same temperature, and you feed them the same type of things that they would be eating, they think they're still in the body, and they continue to turn into more muscle just mm -hmm. in the same way they would. So it's not like this is creating an alternative to meat or a substitute to meat. It is real meat. Um, in, in some ways, it, I think of it almost like the ice industry of old. And so <clears throat> if you think back 150 years ago, only way we had to get ice was from nature. That's it. The only time we could ever get ice was ice that have frozen in a natural lake. And, you know, there were barrens that were created in this ice field where they were harvesting big blocks of ice, shipping it all over the world for people to put in their in-home ice boxes. Well, you enter the advent of refrigeration and all of a sudden you have a much more efficient way to get ice. You now can make ice not from nature, but through technology. Mm -hmm. And that ice is going to be more efficient. It's actually going to be safer. Ironically, at the time, interestingly enough, the ice barons railed against what they called artificial ice. And they said, don't drink it. Don't put it in your glass. It could be dangerous. The ammonia in the coolant might leak out and harm you. But, you know, at that time, actually, the so-called artificial ice was a lot safer because it was being boiled or otherwise filtered, whereas ice coming from these lakes that were contaminated from the Industrial Revolution um, or from horses who were used to carry the ice out of the lakes who don't exactly hold it in while they're working. Uh, you know, that type of ice, the artificial ice was actually safer. And you fast forward to today, we all have artificial ice makers in our homes. We call them freezers. We don't think there's anything unnatural about it at all, but it's still ice. There's no difference. Molecularly, it is still ice. It's just the product of technology rather than nature. And similarly, clean meat is real meat. It is made up of the same exact cells that would form in the animal's body, except rather than coming from nature, it's coming from technology. And so maybe fast forward a few decades from now, and we might think of it as odd to slaughter an animal for meat as we would to go out to a lake and get ice to put in, in our refrigerator, or in on our refrigerator, but in our glasses or in our homes. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, people sometimes ask, uh, what, you know, try to look ahead and imagine what thing we do now that will be considered unbelievably barbaric. Um, and, you know, just as things that people did 
uh, you know, 2000 years ago, like in the Roman Colosseum are considered unimaginable. Um, you know, I've always thought a leading candidate was eating animals. Uh, but I, now it's very easy to imagine that if it turns out that this industry works and you can get the exact same taste uh, ultimately at a cheaper cost, you would imagine, right? I mean, that, that's the plan. The cost, it's not yet, a, the cost isn't competitive yet, but the plan is to make it actually cheaper than raising animals, right? That's certainly the hope. And I agree with you, Bob. I mean, I think that future generations are going to be utterly repulsed by how we treated animals. And I'm not going to belabor the point by going into a graphic description of, of what we do to animals. But as you alluded to earlier, um, you know, most animals we eat are treated in ways that are, are so heinous, we don't want to even know about it. I mean, you know, people start turning off the podcast if, if you even start describing how bad it is. And it's the norm. It's not, it's not that cruelty is the exception. It is the norm. And it's not that anybody is intending to be mean. It's that standard practices have become so obscene so hideous that, you know, if we did the same things to dogs or cats, you'd be put in jail. Yet uh, animals who are like chickens and pigs and, and turkeys are treated in ways that are quite unimaginable. And so I really think that, you know, we, it's easy for us to condemn the failings of our, of our ancestors, right? Our great grandparents or our grandparents and to see how could they have ever believed in what they believed in. Well, it's a lot easier to condemn their failings than to have a more introspective look at where we may be coming up short. And this seems like one of the most obvious candidates, you know, just in the same way that Galileo and Copernicus helped us to understand that we are not the center of the physical universe. I think that more and more people are starting to question whether humans are the center of the moral universe either. And whether or not the animals with whom we share this planet, instead of being here really for us, maybe they're also just here with us. And maybe we shouldn't be subjecting them to the type of torturous conditions that we do. And when we have alternatives that ease our reliance on these animals, it becomes easier for us to see the depravity of how we are treating them. And I'll give you an example. You know, if you go back to the 19th century, we were totally reliant on whaling to light our homes and for lots of other products. Mm -hmm. Today, you know, people would look at you like a monster if you were to kill a whale. I mean, we, we've gone from a top whale killing nation to a top whale watching nation where people will pay money to get on a boat to go look at whales. Imagine telling somebody in the 19th century that that would be a major industry. Uh, people would get on boats and pay money to just go look at whales. They'd think you're crazy. Um, but it's not that anybody had any great moral revelation. Um, it's that kerosene was invented, which enabled us to stop being so reliant on whales, and therefore the cognitive dissonance that we feel when we start learning about how intelligent whales are and how complex their societies are, that all of a sudden we can accept those facts because we are not so dependent on their exploitation. And the same facts exist today for chickens and pigs. The studies show they're actually extremely intelligent animals. Uh, they have good memories. They plan for the future. Uh, they certainly can suffer in, in ways that just like our dogs and cats do. Um, yet it's hard for us to accept and internalize those facts because it would require us to change our behavior and produce a lot of dissonance for us. Mm -hmm. Now, because this is your attitude, to get back to that moment when you, you tasted that, that meat chip, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> you were not a meat eater. Uh, going into that, you had given up eating meat uh, quite a while ago, right? So there was, first right. of all, uh, the question of like whether if it did taste like meat, you were going to like it because <laughs> yeah. people in comparable circumstances wind up being revolted by the taste of meat if, if it's been long enough since they've tasted it and if they associate meat consciously with animal suffering. But what was it? Um, what was it like? What year was this? Uh, the first time I ever ate clean meat was in 2014, and a, uh, a friend of mine named Andros Forgox, who's the CEO of Modern Meadow, which back then was growing meat. Today, they're only growing leather. They're a very cool company uh, based in yeah, New we Jersey. Yeah, we can get into that. There's also the question of whether you can, yeah, 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 yeah do yeah. exactly the same thing with the leather industry via the yeah. same basic technology that we're talking about with, with meat. Yeah, in fact, eat more easily too. But yeah, so I, I stopped eating meat in 1993, not because I didn't like the taste of it. I loved the taste of it. I mean, I was the type of kid who... You know, my dad would bring me to football games and I would be limited to one hot dog per quarter. I mean, it was, you know, it was like I mean, totally obscene how much uh, meat I ate. Um, but 
Uh, anyway, I stopped eating meat out of a concern both for animals and for my health. I was getting, uh, you know, pretty overweight. And then when, I, when the initial impetus for me was learning about uh, animals who I loved and I didn't want to harm, but then also uh, I remember reading an interview with uh, Carl Lewis, who I'm sure you'll remember, Bob, but uh, mm -hmm. many younger listeners might Olympic eat athlete. Intro. Yeah, one of the, he was one the, of the greatest uh, Olympic athletes mm -hmm. ever in track and field. Ever, for sure. You know, for younger listeners who don't know him, you know, look him up. He was like the Michael Phelps or the Usain Bolt of today. You know, everyone on earth knew him back then. And uh, I read an interview where Carl Lewis talked about how he was vegan and how being vegan was actually While he was competing, he was vegan? That was... Yeah, so he said that his best years while competing were the years that he was vegan. And so, like, at the beginning of his career, now, he was a great athlete. It's not like this was the sole key he to success, obviously. He definitely <laughs> was a natural athlete, yes. <laughs> right, so, I mean, it, you know, but he said he did believe that it helped him. Now, at, at the time, you know, when I learned about you know, people who are vegan. I mean, I, I would, first of all, I was very young, but I didn't know anything. I mean, I wondered like, was it healthy? Could it pro probably be bad for you? Um, and so I thought it was the right thing to do uh, because of my love for animals and not wanting to harm them. But when I learned that Carl Lewis was vegan and even attributed a portion of his success to it, that really pushed me over the edge. So you're right. I had not eaten meat in a long time, but it wasn't because I didn't enjoy the taste of it. And I do regularly eat uh, these alternative meats like uh, plant-based meats. And so, uh, and many of them are, are meat-like. And so I still was familiar with that. But yeah, when I first ate it, I mean, it was a small amount admittedly uh, that I ate at Modern Meadow. Um, but instantaneously, I thought to myself, this tastes great. Uh, I remember my, my main thought was I really want to eat more. Like one bite was not sufficient for me. Um, but it was an expensive gift that, that Andrus gave me and it was very generous of him. So I didn't ask him for more, but um, it was pretty cool. And I've since eaten, uh, you know, uh, beef, fish, liver, foie gras, uh, all grown from animal cells. I've held leather that's grown in, in my hands. Um, and in fact, the very first copy of the book, Queen Meat, was bound in... Uh, hmm. It was the, fir the first ever book bound in lab-grown leather. A, a company called Geltor, which is profiled in the book, made a real leather uh, cover for the book that was grown without any animals at all. And we auctioned it off on eBay, uh, the first ever lab-grown leather-bound book. And uh, it was purchased uh, for $13,000 by a collector on eBay. Hmm. And all of the proceeds were donated to a charity called the Good Food Institute, which is uh, a charity that advocates for the interests of cellular agriculture. Mm -hmm. um, isn't it kind of funny, by the way, that leather, it's so hard to replicate the properties of leather artificially, right? I, I mean, I mean, I, I think that actually leather shoes still mm -hmm. are in a sense better than anything we've got short of maybe uh, the kind of leather you're talking about that's, that's made cellularly uh, right. is that my imagination or isn't that kind of or take I, a baseball glove maybe or, or it just seems leather has these properties that that you'd think we'd have managed to imitate yeah it's pretty interesting i, I do think that the alternative leathers like the non-animal leathers of today are far superior to those of the past however uh, they are almost universally produced through petrochemicals and you know have other concerns as well um, you know, it's not to say that leather doesn't have vast environmental concerns in addition to the environment, in, in addition uh, to the animal welfare concerns. But um, the idea of growing leather, uh, growing real collagen, which is the basis of the cow skin and, and mm -hmm. pure in my skin for what it's worth, uh, the idea of growing collagen offers lots of benefits because not only does it enable you to bypass so many of these ethical and environmental concerns, but, you know, just think about it like cows don't come very stubbornly. They don't come in the shapes that we want. They don't come in the shape of a car seat or a wallet or a belt or a pair of shoes. Uh, and so there's a lot of waste when you cut these skins. There's a lot of waste, either that gets used for very cheap leather. Uh, sometimes it gets just landfilled. Uh, whereas when you're growing the leather, you can grow it in any shape you want. You can grow that collagen in any shape. You can make it any thickness. You can make it translucent. You can really have much more control over the product so that you're not just mimicking leather. You actually have a product that is far are superior to leather from a functional perspective. And, and you were saying that leather, that this industry may be economically viable before the, uh, the cellular meat industry? 
Yeah, it's totally possible. So Modern Meadow, which is the leader in the cultured leather space, has already raised over $50 million in capital. They've partnered with some fashion designers, and uh, they're really making real progress. So it wouldn't surprise me if their leather would be hitting the market prior to the first companies that will be selling cultured meat on the market would, mm -hmm. would be doing that, since none of them have raised that kind of capital. Okay, so back to this meat chip. Like more specifically, kind of what did it taste like? Was it like beef jerky or was it? Because I mean, it seems to me one issue is that most of the meat we eat has some amount of fat, right? Yeah, that's right. So in, interestingly enough, you know, you can grow both animal muscle cells and animal fat cells. In fact, there is now a startup that has raised a few million dollars impressively just to grow animal fat. Uh, they're called Mission Barns. They're based in, in the Bay Area. And I ate a um, a product that they made. They made like a plant-based sausage that they added animal fats to. Mm -hmm. And there was a real difference. I mean, you could really taste the difference between plant fats and animal fats. And so now many of these companies, they're going to need to add fat to their muscle. So maybe they'll grow their own fat. Maybe they'll just add plant-based fats as an ingredient. Uh, time will tell. But yes, you don't want to make meat that is only muscle because it doesn't taste that good. That's more of like a protein cake than the type of meat that so, people eat. So what you ate was infused with fat, the chip? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think it was just like a dehydrated piece of muscle. So it was... So, but um, it still tasted okay. Yeah, you know, they may have used a small amount of oil to adhere the barbecue flavoring to it. But mm -hmm. um, yes, yeah, so um, I, I would say it was more like a dehydrated piece of jerky or like a meat chip, like thing like a potato chip but made out of meat. That's more what it tasted like mm -hmm. to me. And then there, there's this famous uh, burger that you write about in the book that cost $300,000 to make, a single hamburger. Yeah. It was the first, it was famously unveiled as the first, you know, hamburger of this, you know, true hamburger not derived from an animal except in this kind of uh you know the, this particular fashion i mean that's a funny thing these you know you you say in the book that you could in principle uh if the, if you were trying to convince people this really is me you could you know have a picture of the actual cow it came from the, the you know the cell came from this cow and and that's the cow that whose hamburger you're eating, but the cow is still alive. That's the only, <laughs> that's the only difference. So, so um, anyway, there was this, uh, I forget which year that was, but this was a hamburger that was funded by Sergey Brin of uh, Google, right? This was his little yes. enterprise. And did he take a stake in this financially or was this just philanthropy? Well, first, I appreciate the pun. Did he take a stake in it? Uh, but uh, second, <laughs> I, I'm smarter than I realized. I, I, I wasn't aware of that. But yes, <laughs> I'm uh, not sure I'm proud of it. But go ahead. <laughs> I'm proud to have noticed. Uh, so uh, no, this was just basically a, a philanthropic contribution. Um, you know, Sergey Brin is someone who's been concerned about both the treatment of animals and the planet for a long time. He mm -hmm. thought this could possibly be a solution to many of the problems that are faced, and so uh, he funded to the tune of uh, nearly a million dollars, the creation of uh, the first ever burgers that were made not from a slaughtered cow, but were made from the, the cow cells. And there were two of them that were unveiled. One of them is the more famous one, which was Eaton, uh, the most expensive burger of all time, as you mentioned, 300,000 US dollars worth of it. And it was grown by uh, Mark Post and Peter Verstrata, two Dutchmen who now have formed their own startup called Mosa Meats which is um, trying to commercialize their first ever uh, burgers within the next couple of years, probably. Uh, but no, he didn't take a stake in it. Um, but other people in his shoes, um, like Bill Gates and Richard Branson, have invested in companies like Memphis Meats, which are also um, racing to commercialize the world's first ever cultured meats, too. Mm -hmm. So um, was that hamburger infused with fat? No, it was just the muscle cells. And so the two tasters uh, said that they did not think it tasted exactly like meat because it was just lacking in that fa that flavor that fat imparts. Mm -hmm. But it was cooked in an oil. And so there mm -hmm. was some fat that was, uh, you know, on the outside. How much of it penetrated into the middle? I'm not quite sure. But they did say that they liked it. And now keep in mind, you know, this is so this is back in 2013. This is like a, a lifetime ago when it comes to this field, because at that time there were zero companies on the planet seeking to do anything like this. Uh, but that was really the first time that showed that it could be done, that you could grow a burger without having to slaughter a cow. Now, admittedly, there had been about... Um, 
about 15 years earlier, NASA had funded research um, to show that you could grow fish muscle outside of a fish. They had done this because they wanted to see if, you know, humans were going to go on long distance cosmic tourism. Obviously, they're not going to be towing Noah's Ark behind them. So if they want meat, they're going to have to grow it on the spaceship. And there was a very uh, bright, innovative researcher at that time named Jason Matheny who read that study. And he was so impressed by it. And he wrote to the authors and he said, you know, <laughs> this sounds really cool for space, but why not do this here on Earth? And they all wrote back to him and they're like, actually, we have soy burgers. We have all these other products. Like, why would you want to do this on Earth? And of course, if you've the answer is <laughs> there, there is an answer to that question. Yeah, right? yeah, that, and that, that was his response too. Uh, <laughs> it's it's not just the taste; it's also the psychological thing. I mean, lot, lots of people will say they want the so-called "quote unquote" real thing, and so he started evangelizing for this industry, and he started becoming like a prophet. This guy, Jason Matheny, started becoming like a prophet for uh, for the culture of meat field, and. Um, he started his own foundation to support it, and eventually now you have a, a thriving industry of startups that are raising millions or tens of millions of dollars to actually do what NASA funded and what Mark Post did in 2013, but to make it into an actual industry that can solve this problem. Yeah. You know, on, on the fat issue, um, I don't eat beef anymore, but back when I did, my, my wife got some grass-fed um, beef. And even that I didn't particularly like because it was it was less fatty than what yeah. I was um, accustomed to. So that, that does matter. Um, yes. It, yeah, it really does. I mean, grass-fed animals generally have much leaner muscle mass, far less fat. And one of the, re one of the reasons why uh, we feed cattle so much corn is to marble their muscle with more fat. Mm -hmm. So um, in, in assessing the future viability of the cultured meat industry, there are a couple of questions that you address in the book. Um, one is, can the cost be brought down to make it competitive? Then the other one is, will people eat it? And there are a couple of different questions mm -hmm. that that breaks down into. But on the economic viability question, is, is there any doubt in your mind that, in principle, yeah, you can get the, the cost down where it's, it's at least competitive with real meat? Or are there... Or, you know, because with some industries, you can see exactly how and why the costs are going to drop. It's just That's not right. rocket science. But sometimes there's like, you know, a, a hurdle that actually hasn't been cleared and it's not clear exactly how you're going to do it. Right. And, and so, so what is the nature of this particular challenge? Yeah, I think it's more the latter. So no, I, I am not totally convinced that the price will certainly come down to be cost competitive. I, I, I think if I had to bet on it, yeah, I, I think it will because I think these are really innovative people. There's going to be a lot of money thrown at the problem. And uh, so I'm optimistic about the, uh, the, the prospects here. But I don't think it's certain. I do think that there are real questions. I mean, if you look at the trajectory, though, you know, from that first three hundred thousand dollar burger in twenty thirteen to today, where now uh, there's a company called New Age Meats, which claims they can make a sausage link for only two hundred and fifty dollars today. So yeah, that's a pretty steep drop. Now, of course, you know, a few people uh, are going to be buying in New York who pay two hundred and fifty dollars for a meal <laughs> now. Yeah, that's right. And and you think about, I mean, if you were to announce that you were going to sell cultured meat sausages for $250 a, a pop, you would have, I mean, thousands of takers right now lining up around the block to be one of the first humans to ever. You mean the same people who bought the first Teslas, basically? <laughs> yeah, sure. Or even look at how many people are, are willing to get in line to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars to go to space for a few minutes. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, space tourism is, is, you know, is a cool boasting, right? But what if you could say, I'm one of the first humans ever to have eaten uh, this type of, uh, this type of meat. So, you know, that's not how you're going to actually compete with the conventional meat industry, but it is an idea for, you know, a, you know, starting this type of a nascent industry of cultured meat. For well, sure. What is, what is the big uh, kind of technological hurdle mm -hmm. or hurdles that makes you not sure that this will ever be economically viable? Well, a few. So you have to feed the cells in order for them to grow. And right now the feed is prohibitively expensive. Right now what they get fed is just uh, not, you have to invent right. new way, new things to right. feed them. Yeah, so, you don't think about that. But, but if you just let cells naturally replicate, which is what you're doing, they have to have food to do that. It takes <laughs> yeah. energy to create another cell, right? 
Yes, that's right. If you stop eating, you your cells will be quite displeased with you. Mm -hmm. And uh, the same is so with these cells. And so you have to feed them. And these technologies that these startups are using, they come from the biomedical space. And it doesn't mean that it can't be brought, the cost brought down. But in the biomedical space, there's not a lot of pressure to bring the cost down because people are willing to pay quite a lot of money for medicines and cures. People mm -hmm. aren't willing to pay a lot of money for food for the most part. And so you're using very expensive technologies to produce something that people aren't willing to pay a lot of money for. So the key is to figure out new ways that you can feed these cells, either with uh, new plant-based ingredients or maybe synthetic ingredients. It's unclear what it'll be. Maybe some combination thereof that you can actually get the cells to be quite happy and to uh, grow and, and multiply without a lot of cost. So that's one. The second is that because these are biomedical technologies, uh, the cultivators that the biomed field uses right now just aren't that big. Uh, compared to what you need here. Like you need massive industrial complexes to do this, to bring the cost down. And it just doesn't exist yet. Uh, that, that type of uh, technology or that type of uh, uh, production facility doesn't exist anywhere on earth. And so you need to build reactors, for example, that are larger uh, for this particular purpose for tissue engineering that have never been built that size before. And so that's another barrier. Um, but again, I don't, I mean, I'm, I'm really trying to, you know, play both sides here by explaining what I think the difficulties are, mm -hmm. but I do think that I'm optimistic about their ability to do it because I think mm -hmm. there's going to be a lot of partnership between the meat industry and these companies to do it because nobody in the meat industry wants to lose out. They don't want to be the one that gets disrupted and have some new technology displace them. Like if you think about the old uh, photography wars where you had Kodak and Canon vying for supremacy, all of a sudden digital comes along. Kodak doesn't want to invest in it because they're afraid it's going to cannibalize their print film technologies. And Canon it did. You all know the the end of the story. You know, Kodak went bankrupt yeah. while Canon now is the largest manufacturer of digital cameras on the planet. So are you so, starting to see traditional meat companies invest in this? Yes, absolutely. There are several. So Tyson Foods, Cargill, one of Europe's largest meat companies called the PHW Group are all investing in this. Now, not all meat companies are so forward thinking. Um, and there is a division in the meat industry because the people who are selling meat to us, like Tyson and Cargill, are far more supportive of this than the people who are producing the animals. So Tyson doesn't care. You know, their CEO right, said, if right. we could produce meat without having to slaughter animals, why wouldn't we do it? That's their, that's their CEO's words. Uh, whereas if you are, though, in the cattle growing business, it's not as easy for you to switch. And so there, there's a division between the people who raise animals and the people who sell meat on this particular issue. Right. Now, on the, on the feeding the cells business, right now they are – they are fed with animal-based food. Is that right? Some of them are, yes. Not all, okay. but some of them so, are. So, so that's one issue is can you, can you work around that? Because I assume that's kind of expensive in itself, right? Extremely expensive. It's useful if you want to conduct laboratory research on the cells. It is completely unfeasible to do if you're going to commercialize the sale of meat. So both from an ethical perspective and from a financial perspective, there just is no way to commercialize these products while still relying on those type of uh, animal-based ingredients like the ones that they've used mm -hmm. in the past. Okay, so you've got technical hurdles, and then there's the question of will people eat it? And I, the two main questions I think you raise in the book, uh, but let me know if there's another one, um, are, first of all, will, will people just, even if it tastes as good as, uh, as good as meat, and conceivably it could taste better than the average meat because you could just precision engineer meat at its very best, the optimal fat to, to muscle ratio and, and so on. But first, anyway, first there's a question of no matter how good it tastes, can people make the conceptual leap to eating you know, meat that didn't involve <laughs> killing an animal? And, and then, you know, and also it has to do with the way words described. It was grown in, oh, in a laboratory. That seems weird, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. But then there's separate from that, the, the question of, are the new plant-based meats so good yeah. that people are going to get, and they are already economically viable, and are they um, going to, um, you know, establish this position of dominance from which they can't be dislodged, right? Yeah. So you raised so many important points, Bob. Let me take them in, in, one by one. So first, on the question of whether people will eat this. Uh, 
I feel quite confident that they will. Not only do lots of consumer surveys show that a huge portion of the public will eat it, but in the places where it matters the most, like China and India, the rate of acceptance is even higher than it is in places like the United States or Europe. So I feel pretty good about that. And as as my friend Bruce Friedrich from the Good Food Institute likes to say, people do not eat meat, generally speaking, because of how it is produced. They eat meat in spite of how it is produced. It's not like they think, ah, I'm so glad an animal was tormented and slaughtered for this particular food. Uh, and so if there was a way to do it without having those negative uh, consequences, I think qu many people would be quite pleased to embrace that. On this issue of lab grown, it is true that the initial experiments are done in labs, but that's really true for lots of different foods that we eat today. Uh, you know, Doritos are originally, in, you know, a product of the lab, but now they're a product of a factory when we eat them. And so the same is so for Wait, example, can you elaborate on that? The, you just mean that that's where the R&D was done? Uh, in yeah, lab, right. That's exactly right. And so when queen meat is commercialized, it's not, it will not be coming from a lab. It'll be coming from a brewery. Think about like if you were to go to an Anheuser-Busch brewery, you would see massive bioreactors filled with microorganisms. You'd see microbiologists in white lab coats walking around with clipboards and you don't think there's anything gross about it. You just think that's how we brew beer. Mm -hmm. Well, they won't be brewing beer. They will look like that, but it'll be brewing meat. So maybe instead of a brewery, maybe we'll call it a carnery. But the fact is that you'll have the same thing. You will have microbiologists. You'll have massive reactors that are growing animal cells rather than growing yeast. And so if people have an aversion to labs, they need not worry because this the R&D was done in a lab, but the actual product won't be coming from it. Now to your third point, and I think this is perhaps the most critical one. Will plant-based meats get so good that they render uh, clean meat unnecessary? And I think that's possible. I mean, I really I don't mean, think it's a small good. issue. They right. are pretty. My my wife brings home some plant-based mm. sausage. I mean, I'm. It, it's just. I I, I would not. Mm. You know, I, I'm. It, it's the equivalent of sausage to me. It really. It yeah. really. I mean, it's not quite. I guess as as fatty but it'll do it's really yeah. close it's not like the old kind of tempe burger <laughs> yeah well it's funny as, as somebody who who loves tempeh myself i can assure you i do not no, think tempe burgers like are meat. fine but they're yeah, not but they, meat. they, they don't, don't taste like meat that's right that's right i totally agree i love tempeh i don't think it tastes like meat uh, however the new products that are being made many of them really do taste like meat and in blind taste tests they they often do fool people not everybody not all the time but many of these products are really that realistic. And so the question is, will they render this obsolete? Uh, and I, I'm inclined to say no, and here's why. The problem of fossil fuels is so bad that you need lots of alternatives. You need wind, you need solar, you need geothermal, and more. You don't want to bet everything just on one. Well, similarly, the problem of factory farms is also so bad that you need lots of options. You need eat less meat campaigns, you need plant-based meats, uh, you want cultured meats, and maybe there are other things out there too that we don't even know about yet. But I think that the problem is so serious that it's worth investing in all of these. And I do think that there will be some portion of the population that wants what they perceive as the so-called real thing, that they will perceive uh, plant-based meats as alternatives to meat, whereas this is actual meat. It is the same in the same way that ice from your freezer is the same as ice that was formed in a natural lake. This is real meat. And so I do think that it is necessary. I think it's a good investment to make in humanity's future and the future of the rest of the planet. But I do think that there will be an upsurge in uh, plant-based meat consumption as well. So right now, for example, if you look at plant-based milks, soy milk, almond milk, coconut milk, and so on, you know, 10, 15 years ago, they were about 1% of the market. Today, they're 13% of the, of the milk market in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And uh, that number is projected to keep on going up, and we're raising fewer dairy cows today than we have in, in decades um, as a result of that and, and other factors as well. And I think that plant-based meats can adopt a similar market share and maybe even more as they get better and better and they get cheaper and cheaper. And so, you know, just the other day, uh, my fiance and I went to Carl's Jr. and we got a Beyond Burger there. And it was like this really incredible experience. Uh, you know, I've never even eaten at a Carl's Jr. in my life. And we went there and we got it and people loved it. We talked to other customers who had also gotten it. They weren't vegetarians. They, they just said they saw the ad in the store for it. So they got it. And I asked them what they liked about it. And they said, it just tastes really good. 
They didn't say, oh, we're glad not to be killing animals or we're saving the planet. They just said it just tastes really good. And that's why they got it. And so if plant-based meat can compete on taste, if it can compete on convenience by being in fast food restaurants, for example, and if it can compete on cost, which it's not necessarily doing yet, but it's getting there, uh, then I think it can really have a huge portion of the market. Yeah, and I gather White Castle, there's actually a White Castle near me. I gather they are serving the Impossible Burger yeah, yeah, you can get the Impossible Slider there. That's really cool. Um, I, I've gotten that too. It's really good. Huh. And the cost is roughly the same as a regular? No, it isn't. So the it's Impossible more? Burger is substantially more expensive than the similar burgers at, at White Castle. And the same is so for the Beyond Burger at Carl's Jr. But the price is coming down. Uh, you know, these products are getting more affordable. They're not there yet, but they are getting there. Mm -hmm. And what in terms of the price coming down on the cultured, um, the cultured meat, what kinds of time frames do you hear? I mean, I guess the the operative way to put it is um, when these companies make their pitch to venture capitalists, when are they claiming it's going to be economically competitive? And then yeah. I guess you would double whatever they say to, be <laughs> to the truth, right? Uh, yeah, there is a lot of puffery that goes on in Silicon Valley, no doubt, um, but. Uh, most of these companies are claiming that they believe that they can put their products on, on the market by 2021. Um, mm. the, uh, however, there are some, I mean, Memphis Meats claims that if the U.S. would allow the sale of cultured meat today, that they would start selling it today. I don't know what type of prices they would offer, but that's what they assert. So uh, just this month in March of 2019, the FDA and the USDA announced a regulatory pathway for commercialization of these products made from mm. animal cell culture. Mm. So this is the first time any nation on earth has explicitly said, we are going to allow the sale of these products. And now they haven't uh, issued any regs, for example, on how it will be labeled yet. So it's not like anybody can just go start selling it, but they did lay out the pathway for how it will be regulated. And the startups in this space feel that the proposed regulations are actually quite reasonable. Uh, they don't, they want regulation. They want to, you know, demonstrate what they're doing is safe and, and good for the world. And so they're very transparent in what they're doing in that respect. And it's possible that you could see the U.S. actually allowing sales of these products uh, sometime in, in maybe in the next year or two. Uh, Sonny Perdue, the Secretary of Agriculture, actually said at a, at a hearing that I was at a few months ago that he wants the U.S. to be a leader in cellular agriculture. You know, you could see them saying, oh, we want to protect our livestock interests. We want to fight this and try to ban it. Uh, in fact, there are some states that have put in bills that would ban the sale of cultured meat to protect mm -hmm. their livestock interests. Wa Washington state is one such state where they tried and failed to pass a bill simply to ban the sale of this product altogether. But now you have the USDA uh, saying that, you know, we don't want to cede this ground to China. If cellular agriculture is how we're going to feed the future, we want to be the leaders in it here. And uh, maybe we could say, you know, make meat great again. I don't know what the slogan will be, but we can, uh, we can have a, um, we can have an industry here that could be, uh, you know, the meat basket to the world, so to speak. Yeah. Is, by the way, is Purdue, is that, is he of the Purdue chicken family? Yes. Uh, no, uh, no, Sam Spelling, but uh, and quite ironic, but no, Sonny Purdue is not related to Jim and Frank Purdue. Okay. Yeah. Um, so there's a, I, I kind of alluded to there being another approach to making this stuff, which is to um, uh, harness, it, it is, it is kind of in the laboratory, but rather than getting like cow cells or chicken cells and get, get them to reproduce, you get something like yeast cells and get them to produce the constituents of meat, even though they don't produce meat muscle per se. And then you, I guess you wind up assembling the stuff in a way that in effect, it's like meat, right? Uh, kind of. So with that type of agriculture, which is called acellular agriculture, as opposed to cellular agriculture. So in, in cellular agriculture, you're basically getting cells to replicate and that is the food. With acellular agriculture, you are getting, uh, for example, yeast or other microorganisms to produce, as you correctly pointed out, the constituents, so the proteins or the fats uh, that you would then use to make liquid type products, so milk or egg whites or gelatin. You can't make meat this way because you need to, you, you can't. Oh, you, make, like, you can't, even in no. principle. 
No, there's there's not a known way to make meat this way. Because you can make the collagen for leather, right? Yeah, that's right. So you can make lots of animal products this way. Uh Collagen for leather, you're exactly right. So you can produce cattle collagen or or any type of collagen this way and then form it into whatever structure, whatever flat structure you want. Uh, In fact, really coolly, the company Geltor that I mentioned earlier, which made that lab-grown leather-bound book cover, uh, they actually took, got, they went online, they got the, uh, the genome for the mastodon, that massive, uh, elephant-like animal who, uh, humans hunted to extinction in North America. And some of them have been sealed shut in these icy graves for thousands of years. And we've now uncovered some of them. We've mapped their genome and they went online, they got the genome and then they printed out their own mastodon gelatin and made gummy candies out of it and ate them. So these guys are the first ever people to eat mastodon protein in thousands and thousands of years. Uh, it's pretty cool that, that they could so do in that. So theory, we could eat dinosaur meat. Uh, well, you can't really get that genome because they were uh, gone not just 10,000 years ago, but like 60, Yeah, but I thought, uh, so aren't, weren't some cells um, mm-hmm. fossilized in amber or something? No? Well, that's certainly what happened in Jurassic Park. I don't know how realistic that is. <laughs> I mean, uh, that, 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 <laughs> with but the I don't, world. Yeah, I don't, I think there's too much, um, too much degradation in the, in the genes, uh, over 66 million years since the dinosaurs went extinct. But, uh, I don't know. If that is true, I would be riveted and I would be shocked that nobody has produced some type of dinosaur protein. But I, I have my skepticism that that's possible. Speaking of protein, one question I have about the plant based meats is, it is, you know, what is the exact uh, kind of composition of it in that mm-hmm. sense? Cause I pay a lot of attention to the ratio of proteins to carbohydrates because I've noticed that if like at lunch I have a lot of carbohydrates, I want to take a nap. So Mm -hmm. what I I assume these plant-based meats that taste so much like meat do not always have like the concentration of protein that you get in true meat or am I wrong? Uh, yeah, you're wrong for some brands and right for some brands. So, okay. uh, for some brands, I mean, they really are using a, a, just a lot of protein. I mean, the Beyond Burger, for example, is like 20 grams of protein. And is that because so, it comes from like beans and things or what? Uh, yeah, it comes from peas. That's right. Mm-hmm. And so it's a soy free, wheat free burger, largely made from peas. And it's not though like you're eating whole peas. These are uh, pea protein. So imagine, you know, if you take the pea, you get rid of a lot of the uh, a lot of the fat and fiber you have over left over this protein. And you can do certain things to the protein that give it the ta- the texture of meat. You add the meat type flavorings to it, and now all of a sudden you have something that tastes like meat that is not from animals, but rather is from plants. And uh, those products uh, oftentimes are quite low in carbon, high in protein. Now you do have some other like you know vegetable patties, so to speak, um, that don't fit that same type of criteria. But the ones that are like so-called next generation plant-based meats, uh, those do fit what you're looking for. How about the Impossible Burger? The new Impossible Burger is, um, it is wheat-free. It's entirely made out, well, not entirely, but it's mostly made out of soy protein. And I don't know what their carbs are on it, but I I do think it's pretty low. And it's Mm -hmm. certainly a high-protein burger too. And I just ate it uh, the other day, and I thought it was fantastic. Hmm. Well, maybe I'll check one out. Um, okay. So, uh, you think one way or another, I mean, do, do, tell me this. Do you think that if, 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 um, cultured meat does not pan out economically, mm-hmm. right. then the day we talked about won't come where people look back and can't believe we ate, ever ate animals. Oh, I still think it will. Um, it maybe not as soon, but I do think that it will. Uh, I, I just think, you know, if you look at the progress that we are making, the general trend is toward expanding our circle of moral concern. Mm-hmm. So if you look back, uh, this you is, know. Uh, P- Peter Singer, who wrote the kind of the Bible of the animal rights movement, animal liberation, also wrote a book called The Expanding Circle that, that, that documents this. Yeah, it, He did, and I, I highly recommend both of those books. Um, and so... You know, if you look back, it used to be that we were primarily interested in our own family or maybe our own tribe, and then we expanded our circle out to include those of other races or religions or nationalities or sexual preferences, and to the point where today most people, at least in principle in America, would say that all humans are like are, are in my circle of moral concern. Mm-hmm. But I don't think we stop there. I think we keep expanding it out to say that, uh, as you do in your new book, that 
you know, all sentient life matters. That is to say, anyone who can suffer, anyone who has consciousness and, and can, has interests that matter to them, that there's a subject of a life inside of that organism, uh, that their interests actually matter and that we ought to treat them with respect and compassion when we can. It's not to say that we're all going to go live like Jane monks and sweep the ground in front of us uh, in order to avoid stepping on insects, but it is to say that there are simple things that we can do to live and let live to avoid causing harm and even misery to other animals who have done nothing to deserve it with the exception of being born into the wrong species. And so if you look at the debates in our country, I mean, think about like 150 years ago, the legitimate debate in our society was whether one human ought to be able to own another human being. Honorable members of society took both sides of this. Doctors, lawyers, members of Congress, they both took, they took both sides of that debate. And, I mean, slavery had been the norm in human civilization for millennia. I mean, long before Lincoln, you know, from the Egyptians to the Greeks to the Romans, they all had slaves. They thought it was a natural part of the human condition. Then you go to 100 years ago. We're debating whether more than half of us ought to even have the right to vote. Or 50 years ago, where we were debating whether whites and blacks ought to even be able to drink from the same water fountains. Or 10 or 15 years ago, where we were debating whether gay Americans deserve the same rights as other Americans. Now, that's not a concluded debate yet, but you can see the trajectory on where it's going. And now think about all of those issues. A blink of an eye ago, historically speaking, you could be held as a respectable member of our society by taking either side on all those views. Today, though, if you were to take the wrong side, if you were to say you were for human bondage or against women's suffrage, you were for mm -hmm. racial segregation, even just espousing that view would make you a pariah in most social circles in America today. Mm -hmm. Just saying that you're for it, let alone doing anything about it, you would be a pariah and you would be ostracized. It would be newsworthy just to say it even. And so we think about maybe 50 years from now, what will our descendants think about our social views? And one of the most obvious candidates for their repulsion is going to be our complete lack of regard for the agony that we cause to animals. And it's not something that is, uh, you know, where we're worried about what someone else is doing. We are doing it. You know, it's us. We are the problem for these animals who are locked in cages. Many of them are unable even to turn around for their whole lives. And you, you mentioned pigs earlier. You know, in the U.S., as we speak, there are millions, literally millions of pigs, these animals who are smarter than dogs, who are locked inside cages that are two feet wide. They can't turn around. They're biting on the bars of their cages. They're developing pressure sores from laying in the same position on concrete all the time. And I'll, mercifully, I'll stop there. But that's the norm in the pork industry. And similar conditions exist for, for chickens in the egg industry and so on. And people are going to look back and think, how could we have been not only blind to it, but even when we learn about it, it still wasn't sufficient to modify our behavior. And so as more and more people learn about how animals are treated, especially in the food industry, I think that they're going to be shocked and they're going to demand reforms that will lead to a moral view that will be incomprehensible to them, that mm -hmm. other animals have so little value that our most trivial interests outweigh their most vital interests. And I feel quite confident that that day will come and it will be here sooner than most of us think. Yeah, I mean, especially given that, as we said, the plant-based meats are already very, very good. They're, they, yes. they taste like meat. And you would think that as that industry develops, these foods will eventually be cheaper than real meat. Because as we said, meat is a very inefficient way to produce, I mean, you know, conventional um, agriculture is a very inefficient way to produce meat. That's right. It is very inefficient uh, compared to growing plants to feed ourselves. It's just not a good way to do it. And it's not the type of strategy to feed an increasingly hungry planet. We're not going to start farming the moon. We're not going to start farming Mars or Venus or Mercury. We have one planet. And this is arguably the most critical time in all of human history right now. Can we survive this great filter as we expand our numbers way beyond, you know, what many people would say is the carrying capacity of the planet? And it reminds me of, um, of what uh, Robert Borlaug uh, said in his Nobel Prize winning speech. This is the guy who was credited with saving over a billion human lives for hybridizing wheat and fomenting the Green Revolution, and lots of people didn't starve to death because of him. But he said that I've bought humanity some time. This is not a permanent solution. That if we don't get what he called the population monster under control, we don't start curbing our numbers, 
that we're going to be faced with the same problem that we were faced with in his time, that without some great technological innovation, we were going to have uh, very serious problems. And we need, I mean, we've not shown any desire to start, you know, to, to start uh, uh, procreating less. Um, certainly in some parts of the world, that's true, but oftentimes it's viewed as a huge problem in places like mm -hmm. Japan where they have negative fertility or not negative fertility rates, but negative uh, replacement rates. Um, people are really concerned about it and they're trying to incentivize people to have more kids there. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, we're not, it's not clear that we are, are so eager to stop uh, replicating ourselves. So how do we get more efficient about how we, how we feed ourselves? Well, cellular agriculture and plant-based proteins seem to be two good alternatives. There are others too. And if people would simply eat less meat, it would be a, a great win for all of us, for humans, for animals, for the planet and more. Um, but just in the way that we haven't stopped uh, replicating ourselves or unlikely to, to stop uh, eating what we have desired to eat for all of human history. Uh, I mean, I, I remember when I was reading your book, uh, The Moral Animal, I was in high school and it was assigned to me. A great book. This was back in the mid 90s and I was reading it. They assigned and, that in high school? Yes. I went to high school in Washington, D.C. and, and uh, my teacher, Walter it, Ailes, had us read it. Was it a public school? No. Yeah. Yeah, I sorry, think so. So, sorry to say. Um, but anyway, uh, I, I remember, you know, reading about uh, meat in, in the book and talking uh, about, you know, this is something that humans have wanted for a long time. And the reality is that it's hard to change human nature. You know, we can modify human behavior to some extent, but changing human nature is, um, is quite difficult to do. And uh, let me say that is a paraphrased quote of Lincoln, so I don't want to claim credit for it. But that's just the reality. Uh, that's just the reality. And so it's not a reality that I like, but it is reality. And if, mm. if we want to actually uh, have a more sustainable civilization, we cannot continue feeding ourselves the way that we have been doing it in the past couple decades. Okay. So tell us before we go a little bit about the Better Meat Company, of which you are the CEO and co-founder. So the Better Meat Co. takes an alternative approach to this. We are not producing cultured meat, although we have sold to cultured meat companies. But what we do is we produce plant-based proteins that we sell uh, to meat companies and to restaurants for them to be able to use less meat. And so, for example, meat companies can put our proteins, which are plant-based, into their meat in order to make the meat tastier, healthier, and more sustainable. So, for example, if let, let's say that... Um, you know, a certain percentage of people will switch to plant-based meat. Well, for the much larger percentage who haven't yet switched, their meat doesn't have to be all animal meat. They can also have maybe, let's say, sausages that are perhaps only 50% sausage and 50% plant-based that actually taste better and, again, are healthier and more sustainable. Hmm. And so we help make meat better by using less meat and by putting our plant-based proteins into meat. And so um, it's a company that is under a year old, but we're having good success so far. Um, my co-founders, uh, Joanna Bromley and Adam Yee and, and Gus Patillo and I are having a great time doing this company. And we're working with great partners, both in the meat industry and with restaurants who really want to do better themselves. And we're glad to be partnering with them. So you work directly with restaurants. You're not, not working with the food processors. So the, in other words, the restaurants would take like, like ground beef or something, raw ground beef and mix it with what you give them? That's exactly right. But we also sell two meat companies themselves so that they can do it prior to it ever arriving at the restaurant. I see. But there is, there, there's not yet a brand I could go find in the supermarket that would have uh, something like this in it? Uh, very shortly, you'll be able to do that, Bob. But stay tuned. I'll, I'll keep you posted <laughs> okay. by email. I'll be the first to know. I hope so. That would be an honor. Okay, great. <laughs> All right. Well, well, thank you so much, Paul. The book, again, is uh, Clean Meat. How Growing Meat Without Animals Will Revolutionize Dinner and the World. And don't forget to check out the Business for Good podcast, which is also yours. Thanks so much, Bob. It's a great pleasure to be with you. As I said, I've been reading your work for literally decades. And so to get a chance to chat with you here is a great honor wow. for me. I appreciate well, it. God bless you. We need more Americans like you. Thanks a lot, Paul. Thank you, Bob. Okay.